What do you get when you combine two of the greatest minds working in the knife industry today? You get what may be the most amazing and sought after collaboration of recent memory. This is the advisor collaboration by Mr. Todd Fisher Sr. and Stan Wilson. This thing is nothing short of absolutely jaw-dropping amazing. And before we get into all the specs and everything else, I do want to clarify that the few of these that were made, the only 30 were made, they were, there was a laundry list of amazing options that you could choose. They're not all decked out like this. They're not all super crazy fancy with Damasteel and Timascus. Uh, there were even some very basic versions done in titanium and carbon fiber. What you're seeing is one of the most dressy variations, but I don't want the materials to mask the amazing work and the achievement that has gone into the making of this knife. Because really, it doesn't take a world-class knife maker, it just takes a good knife maker to take materials like this and make a knife that looks beautiful. All you've really got to know how to do is work the materials properly, you know, shape them properly, then give them a nice polish, uh, do the flame anno on the Timascus, and boom, you can make it look pretty. And a lot of times that will mask junior efforts, meaning there are sharp edges all around the knife, the knife isn't finished all that well, all the way around, maybe the grinds aren't perfect. There are so many things. You could take a basic knife, a very basic slab-sided chamfered edge knife but make it in really expensive materials and wow a lot of people this is not one of those knives you can very easily look through instagram and facebook through the people that own these and see the versions that are not dolled up this fancy and you can see the incredible amount of work that goes into just making the knife itself now uh for the basic specifications it is nine inches in overall length with a four inch blade however with the choil that's done here you have about three and three quarter inches of cutting edge you've got a very long i call it a three quarter length harpoon and then you have stan's signature fin that comes off the backspacer of his advisor models and uh, before we get further into the video the first thing that everybody seems to think when they see this knife or any of his advisors is Oh my goodness, that has got to be so uncomfortable. And I'll admit, it, it, you notice it. It's not like having a fully flattened backspacer, I'm not going to lie. However, where it falls in the hand is right where your hand folds. You see, I'm gripping hard enough for my fingers to turn yellow, yet there's no indentation in my skin. Let's put it somewhere else and push in and you'll see there should have been an indentation if it was a hot spot and it's simply not so just to get that out of the way a lot of people question that because it is obvious when you look at the pictures of this knife you go wow it's beautiful but I don't know about that fin and and honestly the very first time I saw his advisor I wasn't sure about it either but this is Stan Wilson we're talking about. He's not going to make something that's unusable. He's not going to design something that's a pain in the ass to, to, to live with. So even though, yes, it does look very aggressive the way that that shark fin protrudes, it somehow really doesn't get in the way. Now, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, for certain cutting tasks or holding in a very specific way uh, that it might be a little obtrusive, but for a standard hold, the way this knife is shaped to be held, you'll notice the forward finger choil here, the thumb depression behind the harpoon here, this is how it's intended to be held, and it falls right where your hand folds, so no issues whatsoever. Uh, talking about the basics of the knife, as far as the, uh, the action operation, it is so wonderful. It is so smooth. It is so amazing. The detent is dead on perfect. You could not ask for a more perfect detent. It is not too sharp where you feel that it's difficult for it to flip. It's not so loose that you kind of feel like, well, I don't know if it's always going to go to full lock. It's just dead on perfect. 
where all the materials meet. Let's take a good close look. Everything is perfectly blended. The scales, or the, the whole handle I should say, is perfectly contoured, but it's not rounded. And there's a big difference there. To be able to contour the handle, to round off the outside edges, but not create this round, bulb, bulbous, almost shapeless thing takes a great degree of skill and a lot of experience. A lot of trial and error throughout the years of making knives and seeing what works and what, what doesn't. Everything here that looks like it should be sharp isn't. That is very gently rounded off on every peak. Yet it still maintains the look of a sharp angle which goes with the flow of the knife. The flow of the knife is very organic, so very rounded and smooth, and then with very precise points and angles that are added to that organic shape. But again, nothing is sacrificed for the beauty of the design. So you've got a knife that, while it looks like it has sharp edges, it really doesn't. The only thing sharp on this knife is the cutting edge. That's it. Which, by the way, you can see the beauty of just the edge right there. As I take the light off of the Dana Steel and put it just on the edge. For those that don't know, putting an edge on a recurve is not the easiest thing in the world. And as you see, it's been done perfectly. Just, <laughs> just amazing. Uh, so, when I was mentioning earlier that when you went to order the knife, here's how it went down. This is not a knife that you could have just bought on the open market. You could not have called up Stan or uh, Todd and said, hey, I, wanna, I want one of these knives. This was, and I know this sounds terribly exclusionary, and believe me, I don't mean it to, but this is how the ordering process went, for those of you that don't know. Uh, this was an invitation-only knife. This was basically previous customers or good friends or whatever uh, of Todd and of Stan. This was organized. The whole thing was put together. The project was put together by a collector, a very prolific collector. And I don't know if he really wants his name out there or not. So I'm not going to delve too much into that for the sake of his privacy. But his Instagram name is Boats and Blades and his first name is Jeff. That's information that most everybody knows. Um, I won't get into who he is, what he does, or anything else, but Jeff is a huge fan and a friend of both makers, and he thought it would be a great idea to get a, a group of very serious collectors together that appreciate both uh, Todd and Stan's work to buy into these. So, as it's marked inside here, only 30 of these were made, period, that's it, and the list was 30 people long. Now, in that list were a couple of dealers. So a couple were sold through dealers, but it's because those dealers, who are also collectors themselves, were already on the list. Uh, the prices ranged wildly. I don't remember the base price. I want to say the base price, and I could be mistaken by a little bit, was around $2,600. This one was $6,000 with all of the work that you see here. Remember, you're looking at a lot of expensive materials in the Damascus steel, in the Timascus, and that's all this knife is. It is all Timascus and Damasteel. So, yeah, the price obviously went up much, much higher. But it wasn't, not, again, not every knife was made to this extreme degree. I looked at it as, if you're going to take a knife made by these two legends, by two people whom I do consider friends, but I also have a great amount of respect for in their professional arena, and you're going to have them make one knife. It is their first official collaboration, even though they've been friends for decades and live, and I do mean this literally, next door to each other. It is the first full collaboration that they've done. And it may be the only one they ever do. Who knows? So I said, you know what? This needs to be a balls to the wall project in every way. So let's use some of my favorite materials. And you know what? <laughs> it, I, it is very busy. There is a lot going on, but I think it is absolutely magnificent. Is Timascus and Damasteel for everybody? No, and I certainly understand that, uh, but this is a, uh, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and personal preference certainly 
one out. Another thing that you'll notice option-wise is there is a complete lack of hardware except for the pivot. So these beautiful Damasteel scales are set into these Timascus bolsters without the use of any external hardware. And that is thanks to Stan Wilson's keyhole system where basically these drop in and lock in and then are screwed in from the inside of the frame. So there's no exposed hardware except for the custom made pivot that you see right there. As you see, it is a bolster lock that allows you to have the same beautiful look on the lock side that you have on the presentation side. I love bolster locks for that reason. I like frame locks. They're great. I, I, I've owned, obviously, many, many, many of them. But it is always nice to be able to transfer over the beauty of the presentation side to the lock side, and this is the, uh, the way to do that. The other way, obviously, would be a liner lock. I prefer a bolster lock, if possible. You'll notice everything is, I mean, the, the, the word perfection is easy to overuse. But when you look at a knife like this, this is the type of knife that defines what perfection in handmade knives really is. You'll notice the, uh, the mirror polish on the Damasteel is flawless. You see no grind lines left over whatsoever. The polishing is done beautiful. Same with the Timascus. And while I prefer Damasteel over pretty much anything, and I'll explain why in a second, I have learned now that I've made knives in Damasteel that it, it's, it's not the most fun. Uh, it is, it's easier to work with in the beginning stages because when you get that bar... Uh, or that sheet of damascus steel, it, it almost looks nearly like a finished product. It is perfectly flat. You really, I, at least the, the, the bars that I had, I did not even have to surface grind. It wasn't a requirement. They were perfectly true and flat. The material is clean. It looks beautiful. You can see the pattern in it. You don't have to do a test etch. It's, it's, it's incredible, incredible stuff. But it's later on that you as a maker may start hating it. Why? Because it really, honestly, needs to be fully, truly mirror polished without any waves, distortions, or shiny lines. It has to be a perfect mirror before you etch it. And then it has to be etched a very specific way in order to get this contrast. You'll see a lot of makers where they'll use Damasteel and it's just kind of two tones of gray. Or where you see down there the black areas, or it's just kind of gray, it's not really black. Um, that's because Damasteel is not the easiest to work with. And if you don't perfectly polish it, every imperfection will show up. And as you could tell, this was done perfectly, even in the scales. Now, why do I like Damasteel more than most everything else? Uh, because it is so amazing. It takes an absolute fine razor's edge while maintaining strength at that edge. It's not a very brittle steel. Unlike other Damascus, if you're working it, you don't have that fear of, okay, everything's, everything seems to be all right. I made it through heat treat. Okay, I don't have to cross my fingers anymore. Now I'm going to do my finishing grinds and then bam. There's some delamination. The materials have separated. There was a cold shut. There were so many things that could have gone wrong within that steel that you may not discover until you're 30%, 50%, 95% done grinding that blade. With Damas steel, you don't have that worry because unlike a traditional Damascus where you take a sandwich of multiple different steels and you're constantly pressing it, folding it, pressing it, folding it, pressing it, where you have layers of different bars of steel. This is actually made as one piece of steel. So the stainless steels that are used in here are done through uh, the PM process, powder metallurgy. And this is actually made into one piece of steel. So no matter what happens, you don't experience delam. You don't have any of those traditional issues that you do with Damascus. And unlike a high carbon Damascus, this is all stainless steel, so you have uh, greater resistance to rust and corrosion. 
Remember, kiddies, just because something says stainless steel doesn't mean it is 100% rust proof. That does not exist in steel. Any steel, given the right circumstances, can and will rust. However, stainless steels like this will be far more rust and corrosion resistant. Then you get to Timascus. Timascus is the same basic idea of making true Damascus, but instead of using steels to create this pattern welded, uh, pattern -welded uh, look, you're using titanium, which is where Timascus, the name comes from, titanium Damascus. So that material itself is challenging to make. And only a handful of people have figured out how to actually make a Damascus out of titaniums. So it is extremely, extremely expensive, both the Damascus steel and the Timascus. But if you can afford it and you can put those materials together and you're dealing with a maker that truly knows how to pull every bit of beauty out of those materials, you'll never be disappointed. Yes, this is very pimpy. It is very, very dressy. You're, you're not going to climb up uh, for your job up on a telephone pole and start cutting shit. Do you, people, th those of you that are on telephone poles, do you cut shit up there? I don't, I don't know. Is that dangerous? I don't know. But you're not going to hard use this knife is what I'm saying. This is not intended for that. Now, if you wanted to, damascus steel will absolutely live up to that task. As a matter of fact, some of the best kitchen and chef knives used by professional chefs in their kitchens all day every day hard use damas steel bladed chef's knives so don't get me wrong about that what i'm saying is when you're getting into something this beautiful you don't want to scratch it up too much or uh ding it up or anything else this really is honestly meant to be a showpiece but the knife itself chosen in different materials while it's still beautiful is not meant only to be a showpiece it is a, a wonderful knife to EDC, to carry, to use, to just feel the operation of it. Now this one is, is really heavy, because look how thick that damascus steel scale is, times two, plus the blade. And even though Timascus is lightweight, this is very, very thick. There's a lot of material here, and this is not the most EDC-friendly knife. It is quite hefty. Have I carried it? Uh, yep, a lot. Uh, yep, <laughs> I've enjoyed every single minute of it. And talking for a second about both Todd and Stan, um, for those of you that have not seen any of the videos, uh, please do go back in my channel and look at the, 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 the Todd Fisher Archangel that I reviewed, oh my gosh, almost four years ago, yeah, four years ago now. A um, couple of Stan Wilson videos in there. These are guys that are at the absolute top of the game when you start talking about makers that you dream about getting on their books dream about having a knife made by them these guys are right there at the top now with stan it's kind of challenging the last i heard again i don't have any specifics last i heard his wait list was around four or five years long which is not unexpected for a good knife maker uh, the great thing about todd todd's list is long as well but he's happy to add you to it. And as he goes through different cycles throughout the year, there are just times that he's pumping out a little bit more work. He's got a little more time to spend in the shop and he can knock through his list a little bit faster sometimes. You may not have to wait as long. So do keep that in mind. Don't be discouraged if you call him and say, hey, uh, I really want to get a knife made by you. Let me make, let me get a, you know, a, a, a three and a half inch or four inch Archangel and these materials and that and you know all this and he says okay well it's going to be about two or three years don't be discouraged because it could actually end up being less than that um, I know when he built my Archangel uh, it was going to be a while and then one day I got a, I don't know, a call or an email or whatever it was and he's like okay knife's almost done it'd be ready to ship in a couple of days I'm like really I was completely taken aback completely surprised so he is the kind of guy that would rather uh, under promise and over deliver. You know, he's not going to tell you, okay, it's going to be done in a month. And then two years later, it's done because he understands how that feels. Todd's workmanship is stellar. It's amazing. The way that he crafts his knives uh, is, is truly amazing. I've been fortunate enough to stand in his shop watching him make his knives. Uh, he forges his own Damascus, which that was one of the options on this knife. 
Uh, you had a multitude of different blade steels. I believe Elmax was one of the standard steels. Then you could get uh, Todd's Forge Damascus. You could do Dama steel in a number of different patterns. And uh, he, he just has all of those talents. He can make all of his own steel. He has all the equipment. If he decides he wants to make his own screws, he's got his own lathe. He can sit there and make his own screws. He can do it all from the ground up. He's somebody that learned how to make knives by hand, truly 100% by hand, just like Stan did, but also employs modern technology in order to make the product more precise and better. Stan is the same way. Stan, I, I've always called the uh, the mad scientist of knife making. He's when, when you say somebody's a genius, that's often overused, but he really is. Even the way that he has this shop set up, look at the shop visit I did with him on video on my, my channel here. I mean, he has things set up for his convenience on foot controls all the way around. He can sit in one spot and just swivel from machine to machine instead of getting up and moving around and flipping switches. Because every, every 10 seconds he saves throughout the day adds up to minutes, which adds up to hours at the end of the month. And that's the way his mind works. You know me, I'll reach over and flip a switch. I don't think about it taking an extra second and a half out of my day and not how that's going to add up. But in his mind, well, you know, in a year, by doing that one switch, I saved myself four hours. Four hours of reaching for a wall switch. But that four hours allowed him probably to finish a set of scales or to fully grind a blade. Who knows? But the whole point is, you're buying a knife made by somebody that thinks on that level, that is never happy with the status quo. This is a guy that said, you know what, flippers are really popular right now, but I don't like flipper tabs. I don't like what they do to the design of my knives. So he made a knife called the non-flipper flipper where there's no flipper tab and it uses the bolster to flip the knife and to unlock the knife. Just because he wanted to avoid that. Now this does have... Uh, a flipper tab. This is uh, Todd Fisher's flipper tab right there. Notice how short, how abbreviated it is, yet it's easy to access and works perfectly every time. And here's the funny thing, and you guys know this from, from watching me for years, I will nail, I will nail you for not putting jimping on your flipper tab because most of the time your finger will slip right off. But again, this detent isn't so sharp that you're having to exert a lot of force here. It's still sharp, but it's done a very specific and perfected way. I'm able to flip this perfectly every time, and my finger doesn't even come close to sliding off. <laughs> it's just, that's what I'm saying. When you're getting a knife, uh, knives from, from makers on this level, you don't have those small concerns. Yeah, if I was buying an $800 or $1,200 knife from somebody and I'm saying, hey, give me a super hard detent, I'm going to also throw in there, you better jimp that flipper tab because I'm going to need it. If it's a smaller, rounded flipper tab, I'm going to need it. My finger's going to slip off. This one didn't need that. All right, uh, here's everybody's favorite part. Let's get a couple of nice close-ups. I've had to change my lighting setup a little bit here because if I don't, if things aren't really done right, you'll see here that, oh, geez, you really can't see much of anything. So everything's highly reflective, and I've been doing my best to show you all of it. But let's get up close and personal to these beautiful materials, the beautiful grinds, and the beautiful finishing work that are on this knife. Notice how everything is finished equally to the areas that are more commonly seen. God, that's gorgeous. Just gorgeous. And there's the, uh, the signatures right in there. Wilson Fisher, number 22 of 30, get back here, there is the blind screwed Timascus pocket clip, so there's no exposed hardware here, that incredible backspacer, 
just to give you guys a frame of reference, at the size this backspacer is, that's about a $300 piece of Timascus right there. Yeah, maybe, maybe a couple dollars less, but very, very close. Let's call it $250. At least $250 just for that chunk of Timascus right there. The liners, the bolsters, the backspacer, and the pocket clip are all Timascus. The front side and back side scales and the blade are Damasteel. Now when somebody comes to me and says, what is your dream knife? You're looking at it right there. It doesn't get too much more amazing than that. I mean, there are some beautiful art knives out there. There's some amazingly talented makers. And I'm certainly not trying to take anything away from them. Sure, I'd love to have a Michael Walker, Ron Best. There's some amazing guys out there. But let's not forget that our two Florida boys, Mr. Fisher and Mr. Wilson, are in that league, have been forever. Didn't need me to tell you that. And to see them come together on one knife project, as, as small as that run may have been, was truly amazing. Now, when, I, when this was opened up for order, this was a year before, or a long time before I was a knife maker. Um, this is back when I was gainfully employed. I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. Let's do it up with all the fancy shit. You know, then you go to losing your job and starting up your own business and all these other things. Uh, if, if the opening for this knife, for those orders, had come uh, two months later, this wouldn't be sitting here under my lens. I could have never even fathomed affording to do this. You guys will notice I'm not out there buying four or $5,000 knives all the time like I used to. It's very rare that I get something nice for myself because, honestly... Every penny that's that's what you would call profit still ends up going back into the business. That's the way it is. So those luxuries are on hold for a little while. But I was very fortunate that this was offered up just before I tightened my belt. And uh, you guys have seen a lot of my collection up for sale throughout the past year. Every time I had to buy a sheet of steel, I didn't quite have enough there. I wasn't going to sacrifice. I wasn't going to let my family sacrifice. Hey, a couple knives would go up for sale. Got to keep that business going. You got to keep your nose to the grindstone and keep things moving on. So this was, I believe this was the uh, uh, last official big splurge that I had before transitioning into a, uh, into a knife maker myself. So uh, this really is one of those special pieces. I am absolutely delighted uh, to have been able to have this made, to be able to share this here with you. And I hope it gives you guys some sort of idea of why we do what we do, why we collect what we collect. I know that this is not a knife that somebody's going to go out and baton. I know it's not good for bushcraft. I know I'm not going to lay carpet with this thing and start trimming carpet with it. That's not what it's made for. But just because a knife isn't subjected to hard use every day, doesn't mean the owner doesn't appreciate it. You know, there could be knives that you'll own. Maybe you're going to hit the lottery next month. And you're going to buy a $300,000 amazing custom knife. And you, you're going to hang it up on the wall. Who's to say that you're not getting use out of that? You're appreciating it for the artwork and the beauty and whatever it represents to you just by looking at it every day. To you, that's using it. You're getting your money's worth. So don't let somebody tell you, just because it doesn't have a bunch of battle scars all over it and you don't use it to pry open fucking bait cans for your fishing trips, um, it doesn't mean that you're not using your knife and you're not getting your money's worth and that you don't deserve to own it. There are many reasons to own a high-end knife. And here's a knife that really does everything. A knife that you can appreciate for its beauty, for its workmanship, for the choice of materials, for the fact that it can be a useful knife, that if I needed to cut anything I wanted to cut with this knife, that damn steel blade's going to do it, and it's not really going to show any major wear unless I'm really, you know, really being a jerk off and seriously abusing it. This is a knife that can do it all. But the true appreciation is having it in your pocket, knowing that it's there, 
sharing the, the beauty of that knife with your friends when you meet up with them and you put it in their hand, showing it here on YouTube with uh, all my friends here. That's where the real beauty of this knife is. And to commemorate the, the design and the workmanship of two really, really good friends, guys that have known each other forever, that have, they've done things together. There are a lot of times, you know, Todd will post on his Instagram, you know, I just made this knife and I took it over to Stan to get his opinion of it. And they bounce ideas off of each other and stuff like that. But to have the first named collaboration by these two greats, well, that's a pretty big deal. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this look at it. I know it's a little bit of a longer video, but I, I felt that it needed to be. I hope that you enjoyed seeing it as much as I've enjoyed showing it to you. And I'm going to try to get back on the ball and get some more video work done here pretty soon. Until then, I'll see you on the next video.